squat scorn this video is sponsored by squarespace the antoine dupont of website builders Whilst finishing work on this video, details emerged of a toxic, misogynistic, racist, homophobic, and generally destructive culture within the Welsh Rugby Union. What you're about to watch was written prior to this and focuses solely on actions on the pitch, but I wanted to bookend this video by saying that whilst the stories coming out are horrific, the culture clearly evident within the WRU that allowed these actions to continue unchallenged is even more disgusting and a serious independent review of the entire union, the culture within, and the role Chief Executive Steve Phillips and numerous other executives have played in fostering and actively protecting this cesspit masquerading as a national game must be challenged not just soon but immediately. If the internet has taught us anything, and considering how much I know about Roman Undermax's dog, I'd argue it certainly has, it's to know when we're being lied to. In this age of fake news, email scans, and people who have you believe that Bradley Roberts is a real rugby player, we've all got so good at fishing the facts from the fiction. And yet, no matter how adept we get at spotting when a friend's placed a kip on our plate and told us it's an iPad, it's never got any easier to stop believing a lie if you told it to yourself. Just over a month ago, Wales released head coach Wayne Pivak from a contract 10 months out from the Rugby World Cup in 2023. Rewind three years and the task set before Big Boy Wayne was simple. Take the greatest Welsh side since the 70s and make them play like the Welsh side from the 70s. The Welsh public, we were told, had grown bored of Warren Ball. The Gatlin style of crash at rugby, kicking smartly, defending well and actually winning rugby games was not what anyone wanted anymore. It was time for some proper rugby chaos. The tale of Cymru's PVAC patch is one of endless fibs being heard as facts, and an even greater will to believe what you're telling yourself, even when the evidence is right there in front of you. And now that Takapuna's least badass cop has gone to hang his tasteless curtains up somewhere else, it's probably time that we take a bit of a look back at Wales' weird gas leak years. The era where Wales weren't Warrens. For today is the day of the PVAC post-mortem. When Pivak first floated over to Wales in 2015, when the Scarlets found themselves in search of a forwards coach who would emphasise skill set as much as a set piece. Pivak interviewed to be an assistant, but turned up one day to find his boss had buggered off to Ireland, and in some sort of extremely undramatic West Walian hamlet, found himself made head coach by default in the end. And whilst the slings and arrows ruled over his first two seasons, in year three, finally came. The outrageous fortune. The Scarlets had always been fun to watch with Pivak in charge. They played an aggressive system with as many jackal threats as possible in the team, targeting turnovers and scoring so many tries from the moments immediately afterwards, slinging the ball wide once they won it. But as that third year bedded in, those lovely tries began happening more and more often, going from mere consolation scores to tries putting them properly in contention. Until, in the second half of that season, having had a pretty horrid start, those tries started putting him in the lead. This beauty became enjoyment, and the enjoyment bred a team spirit. The players loved playing there and worked hard for one another, something that came to a head as they overcame a red card to defeat Leinster in Leinster in a semi-final before battering Razzy Erasmus's Munster team a week later to win the league title in Dublin, playing some utterly breathtaking, amazing rugby along the way. This try was scored in a grand final. That's how good and fun they were. They kept this success up, more or less, the following season, losing the grand final eventually to Leinster, but also managing to make a European semi-final for the first time since 2004, which they also lost to eventual champions of that competition, Leinster. And you know, that was alright, wasn't it? Only losing to Leinster? That's fine. Everyone loses to Leinster, that's not a problem worth worrying about. And so, Sure enough, the WU went, wait a second, Leinster don't play international rugby. So if he only loses to Leinster, that means Wales won't lose to anyone. Clearly confused by the fact Leinster play their internationals in green, so they appointed him to take over the team in red. Munster. Just kidding, I meant Portugal. Pivac's role as Gatlin's successor was an open secret in Wales almost a year before it was officially announced. This was the guy, everybody thought. This was the guy who would bring sexy rugby back to Wales, just as he had for the Scarlets. He would make Wales attractive to watch again. They would play with flair. Wayne Pivac was brought over to get Wales playing in what so many had cringe-inducingly dubbed the Welsh way. It's something he admitted in his first press conference in the job. It's the first thing the WOU said in the official statement on his appointment. And it was, we were told, what the Welsh public wanted, after all. So let's dig a little deeper. What exactly was Wayne attempting to do with Wales? How was he going to go up playing this sexy rugby? And why did it work out so so poorly that he got sacked um, a year before the end of his contract. 
The game plan PVAC and attack coach Stephen Jones attempted to implement was at once extremely complicated and incredibly simple. Where it was primarily adopt the shape Japan had pioneered at last World Cup, PVAC side would spread their full pack across the width of the field, the idea being to get carriers into wider, more dynamic positions, where a traditional structure such as the 1-3-3-1 adopted by the likes of South Africa positions your biggest carriers in midfield to smash it up, you know, you want them onto the ball, running onto it with pace, bam, 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 together as a group. The 1-3-2-2 looks to have your biggest boys hitting wider channels, where there's more space instead of playing the traditional Bosch zones around the ruck. In order to get that ball wide, they play primarily off 10. Bigger or Anscombe or whoever else positioned in this kind of zone to select the runners. He would generally have three here off him and another group of two wider, with another pair on the wing if Wales wanted to go that far out, hence the name 1 3 2 2. It's a system built to get the most out of ball carriers' pace and skill rather than their raw power, hence why a player like Jack Morgan has excelled within that system of late in the autumn. It's almost custom built for a player like him. Every forward always has multiple handling options as they go into contact. Several players they can pass to and offload to, staying true to Pivak's roots as a forward coach who emphasises skill set, not set piece. We'd see backs and forwards alternate roles. Here, Donovan Davis is acting as a second hooker whilst Tipperick operates as a centre. We forget, but when the system worked, it genuinely was kind of breathtaking and incredibly effective. Because every part going well has a knock-on effect that makes the next one even more difficult to defend from opposition. This is a perfect example against Ireland from Pivak's first Six Nations in charge. Clean ball off the line out and Bigger hits Tipperick. Hadley Parks, who yes I forgot played in this era as well, runs a dummy line that draws Jumbo Jet Sex attack and allows Tipperick to cannonball over the game line. The ball is lightning fast, which allows Wales to go wide. Ireland's forwards are still setting in position after the line out and it forces fullback Jordan Lama to come up into the main line. Stockdale drops from the opposite wing to go and cover Lama's position, but Wales have got to an edge, which is the position where the attack works best. It works best when they're on a touch line, generally across the whole of that pattern. That's just how the pattern works. It's designed to be attacked off a touch line. And Bigger has these three forwards here around him, but instead, Parks picks a flat line late between defenders and it splits the Irish defence really effectively. With them a man short in the far side, because of Stockdale's absence, Bundyoki sprints round to cover, so Halfpenny notices him leaving his position. The carry is directly into Henshaw, but with Sextrube also here, Wales know exactly what to do. Instead of sending a carry into the gap, Bigger sends Tipperick straight into Omani and Furlong, maybe the bravest thing anyone's ever asked of a teammate, because it will force Arky here to step in and defend as a forward. The previous few phases, having brought him out, meaning the one more, now pulls him completely out of position, meaning he's no longer able to organise the short side. Edge forward Alan Wynne Jones then, darts in between the only Irish cover and can free an arm. Because the other backs are all on this side, it's easy to fix both Lama and Stockdale at once. No one's catching up with him in time to put Williams under the sticks. Each carry makes the entire attack more effective and pulls Ireland about more and more until the only player around to organise their defence is forced to step in and play a secondary role, allowing them to get one offload in, and that's all it takes because, you know, it's only forwards to score the try. It's largely the same approach that Wayne Pivak took to designing a website. Using Squarespace, the world's most favourite, bestest website builder, he was able to use each element to compound and make the next one even better and more stunning. Beautiful backgrounds making the video elements pop, which drives people towards the social integration features and the mailing list as well, the mailing list features. And whilst some website builders might make this sound complicated, PVAC was able to easily get the elements working together, even without Justin Tipperick, thanks to Squarespace's easy-to-use interface. And if you want to follow suit and do the same, then please use the offer code SQUIDRUGBY and you can save yourself some Wonga at the checkout. Please do it. It's lovely. Squarespace, good work. Wayne PVAC had a system for rugby that he knew could work at international level. Forget John Peter Rees, PVAC would give us a new JPR, but as the shoots of just pornographic rugby came through, wouldn't you know it, Wayne began to lie to himself. This structure started to work plenty of times. It started to work an awful lot, but it properly clicked, got to the stage at which the forwards were finding holes, defensive areas starting to stack and compound themselves around six times in three years. Now, there's a number of reasons for this, but all of them come back to three simple problems which ultimately reflect one issue. Wayne Pivak is stubborn. Let's start breaking this down a little more. The Stephen Jones system played almost everything off 10. Now, playing off 10 doesn't mean the ball literally goes through the hands of the guy wearing the number 10 jersey every single time, but that an outfield first receiver, rather than the scrum half, is a player selecting which forward is going to carry or where the ball is going, whether it's going wide, on the vast majority of phases, if not all of them. The scrum half's job with Wales was stripped back to the point in which they didn't even get to be a prick. You just run to the ruck, 
pass, run to the next ruck, pass again. Speed of ball is vital, decision making unimportant, even discouraged. This, combined with him being so slow that small birds would land on him as he was reaching down to pick up the ball, is what ended Reese Webb's Wales career. The scrum half was a membrane, they're not there to make decisions or snipes themselves. Wales played off nine only within the 15 meter zone here to try and refine shape, whilst the rest of the team, because they play best off an edge, is getting into their set shape. However, there was one really big difference in how Pivac ran the system with the Scarlets to how he ran it with Wales. Instead of using the fly half as a first receiver as he would with Wales, the Scarlets frequently dropped in a winger. Steph Evans and Johnny McNichol were both natural ball players who could easily slot in and drop off balls to forwards, whilst an actual 10, usually Bruce Patchell, would sit out the back assessing the bigger picture, waiting for his moment. Not involved with minutiae, he could spy what's on, what's not, and be in position to throw the most important passes, be it a looping Hail Mary or an early ball that just had to be perfectly timed. The Scarlets wanted their best passer, their real playmaker, playing that role. Think of it like McNichol and Evans were the day managers and Patchell the CEO, the wingers running the operation so the big dog, the fly half, can make the important decisions from upstairs from a kind of better centralised position. It created an attack that was so dynamic, always moving, shaking, yet also had somebody waiting to pull the trigger and deliver the killer blow when he needed it. The blindside winger is usually the most disposable player in the system, so Pivac made him invaluable. Except when promoted to Wales Corp LTD Limited, Pivac found himself with an issue, where with the Scarlets, he was able to identify the types of player he needed to play the system and sign them, sloshing money about to bring Patchell over from Cardiff and McNichol in from his native New Zealand. With Wales, this wasn't an option. He couldn't do this. A national team forces you to, it's really funny this, select from the players in that nation that that nation has produced. And if you wanted anything other than and that, you either had to wait five years or be Spain. And so Pivac told himself, okay, this is fine. Wales, as a nation, had just three qualified wingers who could play the first receiver kind of role Wayne wanted. Steph Evans, who Pivac had fallen out with during his time at the Scarlets and refused to select late on, and then again refused to select during his time with Wales. Hallam Amos, who was almost always injured before going sod this, I'm in the hospital enough, I might as well work here. And McNichol himself, now qualified on residency. McNichol played in Pivac's first five games in charge, and yet, at test level, didn't quite cut it. He was a few percent off the pace, and his pace a few percent off. He simply wasn't working after five attempts. Three options, good as became none. But then you looked at Wales' options on the wing who weren't natural ball playing first receivers. And who did you see? You saw five British and Irish Lions. The team that would best execute Pivac's game plan was nothing like the best team that he could select. This gave Pivac and Jones a choice. Pick the best players and change the plan. Or select a side to execute the attack and hope they're up to scratch. Pivac did neither. Instead attempting to just make do with what he had and make it force. Make it, you cram it into this game plan. You've got to put it in there. You've got to put it in there. Josh Adams is one of the best wingers in the world. I am one of Josh Adams' biggest fans. I love him. I think he's absolutely incredible, but he is not a natural ball player. Yet, because it's the PVAC game plan, he often found himself forced to slot in and play as a kind of auxiliary outside half. This is a pretty typical example. He stands extremely static, offering no threat and no options set around him. He takes the ball standing still, his body language saying it can only have good to beard, it's so closed off. He throws an average slow pass and it's such an easy read, easiest read in the world for Quagga Smith. Like this is, this is, this is like Roll Dahl books level great for Quagga Smith. He nails where it was 10 meters behind the game line purely because Pivak asked Adams to play a role that suited none of his strengths. And so Pivak attempted to adapt the game plan. For an awful lot of the era, we saw Dan Bigger, Reese Prieston, or whichever unlucky sod was stuck in the fabled jersey that day, having to play the disposable distributor role, the, the winger's role, themselves, rather than standing back and watching for the bigger picture, as Reese Patchell had. And broadly, it looked a bit like this. Wales play a phase off 9 to reach the 15 metre line, and then once the ball comes out, there are four options open for Bigger, and it allows him to invite Navidi over the game line and create that gift of quick ball that they're hoping for, that the wing would normally create. However, because he was in tight the phase before, there's no shape set for the following phase, because Bigger wasn't there to set it, because there was no fly half about to run what they're going to do once they're over the game line. Ideally, Wales have the blindside winger here, with Bigger in Owen Watkins' position, and Watkin running either support or a dummy line, but instead it just becomes incredibly telegraphed. Brex reads it easily, and Petinelli just does a brilliant job slowing the ball down, meaning Bigger has to go into the next ruck. Nobody organises the shape then, it just looks awful, with Thomas running directly into a solid Italian defence. The next phase, yes, Bigger is back up on his feet, but the only option he has alongside him is 
military summit. There's nothing really going on. Italy eat it up easily. Wales have now lost 25 metres in seven phases. And whilst this is a pretty good box here by Hardy, it's still only three metres further upfield than Wales started with the ball. Or oh, here, bigger drops off the pass first phase. Whilst North carries pretty well, he loops around and calls the ball out, except there's nobody bloody with him. It makes Wales extremely repetitive and obvious. Scotland here don't mind that Tomkins has crossed the game line because it's exhausted Wales' options for the following phase. Bigger has three choices. One would be stupid. The second, from a Scottish perspective, is ruled out because his body language just means he can't throw this pass, meaning the ball is only ever going to Reese Samit, who himself only has one man in support and catches it in such a shape that he can't ship it on quickly. It's so easy for Chris Harris to shut down and then two phases later, Wales finally regroup and Scotland know they're going to run a crash off bigger because there's nothing else said about the boot here, meaning Schumann can wait and just target this ruck because he knows what's coming and win this turnover. Or here in the same game, Wales have no forwards out of bigger, so Scotland see how flat Tompkins is sat and figure this isn't how they run crash ups. We know what they do, they do the same thing every time, so it must be a chip over the top, allowing three players to turn and cover it before Biggers even kicked it and Hodkinson wails back into their own 22. Wales sacrificed an entire attack of cutting edge for one phase of game line momentum by forcing the fly half to come in and throw this basic pass to get them going forwards. Because Wayne Pivak kept telling himself that he could make this plan work. And the ironic thing, the really ironic thing, is that in his last game before he got fired, the mad lad bloody did it. He finally did it. But not for anything he did himself. The Ospreys just happened to produce a 16 stone centre come outside half who made the step up to test level flawlessly. I went into some detail on my video on the Australia game as to why Joe Hawkins made such an impact coming in and keeping the second wave for the Welsh attack organised, but it allowed the outstanding Gareth Anscombe to slot into proper game management mode, play the role that Patchell had for the Scarlets, and suddenly he was able to trust the day-to-day -to, -day to be managed and take over in the CEO chair, waiting to identify and pull the trigger. However, whilst Pivag looked for a way to solve that one problem over and over, he wasn't quite so astute in how he attacked the other big issue across his era. The attacking breakdown. Because whilst it was entirely possible to just wait for Wales to lose shape and run out of numbers, you could speed up the process enormously by just smashing the ruck immediately after the first big carry. Whilst it didn't always go this badly, Wales frequently found their one 3 2, -two shape evaporated inside two, maybe three phases, simply because extra players had to be dragged into the ruck. It's really hard when your system relies on so many players being on their feet to do so if so many have got to go off them to enter rucks. Here, Wales do well to spot the space and Tompkins gets Williams into a hole, but the players around him aren't really set for anything. Spotting he's about to be isolated, Rollins, Hallaholo and D all fire in to clear out and Tompkins himself runs in as well, wondering if he might be needed. This means once the ball comes out, six Welsh players are tied into this tiny patch of ground here. Noticing this, McNichol runs in to try and get into the boot, the zone behind the, the play, but he's headed against the grain so the ball's never coming out of him, that'd be really daft. The Aussie defence walks up, waiting for Thomas to tip it on, knowing if he does he'll be totally isolated and yet if he doesn't, he'll be smashed. It's a really easy read, both centers out of position in the back row, all on one side, so there's no one there for the quick clear out. Skelton claps over it, giving Australia the penalty that gives them the lead late on in the game. One of the biggest gambles of the Wayne Pivak era was how reliant Wales were on backs solo clearing out rucks in order for the forwards to get in shape. Wales' attack worked best off an edge and required probably seven of the eight forwards and at least maybe three of the four kind of of the midfielders and the fullback to be on their feet. And so, if we look at the two best, cleanest passages of play, where it was managed under PVAC, where the game plan, this attack, click the best, that Thomas Williams try I showed earlier, and Liam Williams' score against England in 2021, both have one thing in common, really key thing, which is that they have a ruck, such as this, where the only players tied in are the back three, it's the two wingers and the fullback in this ruck, allowing everybody else to set shape and play the attack the next phase. Now, if you attack to run flawlessly, you require a ruck with your fullback and no forwards, you've already got to ask how often are you going to find yourself in a situation where you can afford to run that, but it also just presents an opportunity for the opposition. Wales' first two games of this era were against the Barbarians and Italy. And they ran up big score lines in that because this was possible. However, the moment they came up against someone else in Ireland, this was identified and ruled out immediately. It took two games for people to work out they could target this. Such as, here, this is initially a really good attack by Wales. Davis compounding Wainwright's carry with a great angle. And whilst things are disrupted slightly here by Pivak asking Josh Adams to be a playmaker again, it was that phase. Wales recover and Anscombe throws a great ball to get Basham over the gain line and create some real momentum. They're going forward really well. However, after a few phases, as usual, the shape dissipates a bit, that's fine. So Wales look to do the usual trick and get to an edge in order to reset on the other side. They just have to get wide and in a 
reset once they're near the edge of the touchline. Except, because they want at least seven forwards on their feet once they get out wide, they send just one back in to carry on his own and one to clear out. Leonard Brown gets over the ball and wins the turnover with real ease. It's really easy to target. If opponents were smart to it, if they'd done any analysis, they knew if they were willing to be patient, Rucks with walk-in turnover opportunities would present themselves out wide fairly regularly one way without the ball. However, as ever, because the breakdown worked in theory and occasionally enough in practice as well, Pivac failed to produce a contingency plan. Wales had exactly the same issues, not sending men into the breakdown, relying on backs to clear out. In year one and year three of the Great PVAC experiment, New Zealand's answer to offers a dibble, conning himself into thinking this was a matter of accuracy and discipline instead of a tactical miscalculation. Which was an idea that comes up quite a lot, because we can now move on to the third issue within the big three stubbornism problems. The kicking game. Except the problem wasn't the kicking at all, because if you were to map out everything Wales have done over the last few years on a graph, their actual booting has been about the only area of the game they've consistently got right and executed well. And yet, over the last 80 months, Wales have become the T1 nation who kicks the ball least. If you remove three huge outliers from the last 18 months games, Wales found themselves kicking an average of 6.8% of their ball, well below the 11% average in Test Rugby. In fact, if you break it down even further, once you take out clearance kicks on the round 22, Wales are often kicking on their own terms only once, twice, maybe three times a game. However, right, those three enormous outliers from the last 18 months where Wales kicked above the international average on all of them were the gutsy scrappy win over the Springboks last summer, the narrow defeat to France where they did a brilliant job of just keeping them to bay, and the excellent deconstruction of a Pumas team who'd beaten England a week earlier. Arguably, their three best performances in that period. Wales won the 2021 Six Nations. Actually, I'm, I'm going to say that again because it doesn't sound real. Wales, yeah, they did. They won the 2021 Six Nations by playing a pretty open attacking style of rugby. And clearly, Wayne Pivac saw that as some sort of vindication. Vindication that he shouldn't be playing a kicking game. Completely ignoring the fact that the open style of rugby was only possible because they had the best kicking game in that year's tournament. Wales, I felt, put in the best performance of the entire Pivac regime against England that year, scoring more points and more tries against the old enemy than any other Welsh side had in history, whilst also holding on to win, which separates them from the other strong performers against South Africa, Australia, and France. But they did it playing an outstanding, calculated kicking game that nullified England. Wales kicked 14% of their ball that day, leaning heavily onto attacking kicks around the 50 metre line and these exceptional box kicks by Kieran Hardy, who on his own kicked more ball in the 46 minutes he played than the entire Welsh team put together over 80 in the following year's fixture. It's impossible to win modern test rugby without a good kicking game. You just, you, you can't do it. Wayne Pivac had one, but told himself, no, that's only plan B. We don't need it. And instead, if we look at the now shiver-laden loss to Georgia, it was the same story. Wales kicked well for the first hour. This comes as Georgia are getting some momentum and it's brilliant by Priestland, gifting Wales a huge net gain. But they found themselves unable to do anything with that position. Line up thrown not straight here. Or here's another great kick by Priestland that presents Wales with a chance to counter-attack after Georgia clear it. But the classic going wide ruck problem rears its head again. Priestland is expected to clear this out on his own. The fly off is going on, on his own to clear this out so obviously Georgia turn it over they can really easily attack this out wide it's frankly an unbelievably dumb attack having your one playmaker taking out the game to perform a task they're not suited to because your shape requires having at least seven forwards on their feet then the moment Georgia scored the try to get back in the game Priestland is brought off and on comes young Sam Costello to win his second cap at which point Wales essentially stop kicking in the last 20 minutes whilst Costello's on the field they kick the ball only twice. A clearance here by Thomas Williams from his own line, and this box kick after 11 phases of going nowhere, which, funnily enough, almost actually results in a score, because Talipi Falatel's incredible. One thing that I've left out of this, Talipi Falatel's a magician, and even Pivac can't ruin him. Georgia, meanwhile, are kicking the lever off it, pinning Wales back and eating up territory, which allows them to eventually get into positions to win the game. Whilst an incredible win over Italy took a phenomenal 80-minute, 23-man performance from Georgia, beating Wales only required them to hold their nerve and stick to the tactics they'd laid out from the start. If Wales kept kicking the ball, they probably would have narrowly won one of the ugliest games you've ever seen. But instead, they started presenting Georgia with chances to take the lead. And they took them, because they're a good team. But also because, perhaps alarmingly, Wales let them. Those final 20 minutes had an air of inevitability. One that also haunted every moment of the Italy game, or at least the ones where Josh Adams didn't have the ball. 
Wales start to believe Georgia were going to win at pretty much exactly the same moment the Lalo start to believe they could. If we look at the best performances under Wayne Pivag, which for me were these guys, look at these, these guys, they were the games where Wales kicked the most ball. The average for those games shoots up to 13.4%, way above the 6% we were seeing over last year's Shoddy Six Nations. Yet Wales remained convinced the way to keep playing attacking rugby was to keep the ball in hand instead of varying the play or notching up and gaining territory. And this leads us to the biggest lie of all. Wayne Pivak was hired by Wales because the WIU believed he would be the man to create a new golden age of attacking rugby. He would be the guy who stabbed the stadium with the tries that had the entire crowd weeping tears of Brain's beard that fell on the ground to spell out the word Hirife. The side playing rugby that would grant Gareth Edwards eternal life and shoot Max Boyce to number one in the worldwide Spotify charts. The WIU believed Wayne Pivak would bring Wales back to the long heralded Welsh way that was born of the 70s when Benny and Barry and Gerald and JJ and JPR and Mighty Gar took flicks from Fenwick and scored a worldie every week. Wales was headed back to its glory days. In fact, we forget this now, but the entire Gatland era, every single week, a different ex-player turned up on Scrum 5 to bemoan how boring this winning rugby shit was. Every week, a new article went out in the Western Mail about how making your tackles was an insult to the memory of Ray Gravel. And every game, Welsh fans complained about kicking. All this time not realising the lie they've been telling themselves. Because the truth is, Wales has never been a nation of free-flowing rugby. It's never been all about excitement and offloads. If you go back and you watch those great tapes of the games from the 70s, and I mean really watch them, not the highlights or the occasional moment on YouTube or the VHS tapes we all burnt out burning this stuff into our brains as kids, you'll be struck by two things. One, just how few players could actually catch the ball. But two, the thing that really stands out about Wales, the thing that really gets to you about Wales, isn't their flair, it's their spirit. The entire history of Wales, and I mean as a nation, not just as a rugby team, is one of being the world's chippiest little bastards. Every single notable day in Welsh history, every single one, the Welsh were outmatched, outgunned, outnumbered, outmaneuvered. Yet in so many of them, in so, so many of them, Cymru comes out on top. It never did it through flair, it did it through being a stubborn little shit who's never afraid to say no for what they believe in. That unwillingness to accept defeat is the reason Wales is still a nation. The famous team of the 70s boasted some of the best players of all time, some of the most skillful of their era, yet they won as many games as they did because they were resourceful, they fought hard, they scrapped harder, and they never gave up. Not because of the style they deployed to get there. Watch those classic Five Nations tournaments back. And so, so many of those games were won by Wales at the death in the last 10 minutes. They were decided late on because one player stood up and took it on their shoulders to reward their team's 80 minutes of effort. The reason this team has stayed in so many people's hearts was because they always found a way to remain defiant and represent the nation that they truly loved, no matter the situation they got stuck in. Warren Gatland saw that. His mantra with Wales was to be the best team in the world at the things that required no talent. If it's a matter of work rate, of effort, of spirit, of togetherness, Warren Gatland's Wales came up on top every time. Gatland got more out of Wales than any other coach in history because he understood Wales better than we understand ourselves. And that's who's headed back to take over again. There are those in New Zealand especially who question why Warren is so beloved by Cymraegs, but it's because he saw us. It's simply the perfect matchup of leader and people. Whilst his turnaround time is short, it's only 24 days fewer than he had to prepare the eventual 2008 Grand Slam. And it all begins, rather fittingly, with Ireland, the number one team in the world, up against a coach who always managed to get really, really under their skin. And then, after the Six Nations, a pretty generous path for a World Cup where, thanks to a pretty lovely draw, reaching the final is nowhere near as impossible as it should be to take a glance at the last few years. That's the task Warren Gatlin has before him, to reconnect with the nation that he understands and take them to heights they've never seen before. And so we look back at the PVAC era, a three-year patch where Wales was given what it wanted, what it called for, what it felt it needed to connect with its golden age roots. And so Wales started playing an attacking game they didn't have the equipment for. Wales stopped kicking, even though it was their greatest weapon. And Wales eventually stopped believing, even though it was all we had. Wayne Pivak was the manager Wales deserved, an incredibly good, talented, intelligent coach who was stubborn, committed to romantic notions that wouldn't work, and refusing to accept the facts 
they've been laid out before his own eyes. Wales are back now with the coach who tells them the truth. The man who would never let them do a multimedia presentation with a kipper. The guy they needed rather than who they wanted. It's now on Warren Gatland to use that truth to make us all believe once again. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. There's a video I've been working on since the end of the Autumn Internationals before I even knew if Wayne Pivak was going to manage to somehow keep his job. Uh, he's obviously gone now. It's all different. Everything's changed. And it's also happened to come out in probably the um, low week in the history of Welsh rugby. Um, but actually, it's just a week that reflects this kind of this sheer ugliness of what's been going on the last uh, few days. The ugliness has actually been evident within the Welsh Rugby Union for a very long time and has just been covered up and not been talked about. Um, so I want to make a very clear point of talking about it, because I think we all have to. I think it's on all of us to keep, make sure the story continues. There have been major publications that haven't wanted to cover this. There have been some that haven't covered this. Um, and I think it's important that this rolls on so that change happens and change continues to take place. At the minute, the WAU think they can roll on by, they can continue and they can kind of brush under the carpet and all change once the Six Nations begins in a few weeks' time. That cannot be allowed to be the case. This needs to continue and become the major, continue being the major story that it is at the minute, right the way through the year, until we see evident change of the culture, until we see the WOU become a place that is safe for people outside of the kind of, you know, the, the traditional balding demographic that they hire to a safe place for them to, to work and to visit and to, you know, to look up to, because at the end of the day, as much as we come and support our nation during the Six Nations and the World Cup, we're ultimately supporting that union. And I know I'll certainly struggle to do that whilst we still have stories of this culture, whilst we're still aware of this culture existing within Welsh rugby. And I think it's very important that we all, as supporters, as fans, make it extremely clear continually to WRU over the course of the Six Nations that that will not stand until proper change has started to take place. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you will stand in a similar position on that. And I'll see you very soon next week for another rugby. Do you still love eating your toenails?